The first murder case I ever worked was on Europa Station. I was young, although I didn't think so back then. Just out of college, barely three weeks since I made detective. They paired me with a fat old Bulgarian who was supposed to show me the ropes but spent most of his time sipping from the flask he hardly bothered hiding and watching the calendar tick down towards retirement. So I was mostly on my own and cocky enough to think that was a good thing. Europa Station was a hard place in those days, back before the war, I mean. Before the military started dumping freighter loads of money into it, it was just miners and the things miners like. Bars, casinos, and whorehouses. The whole place was one big red light district, literally with the constant glare of Jupiter coming through the glass domes. The body was in the Kevalite district. There were plenty of alien communities on Europa Station. Lorians came to try out the waters of the moon below us. They liked the cold and the dark. It reminds them of home. The Tark came for the same reason as the few human tourists we got, to ride the ice on Europa's surface, on sledges and skis and even luges, the most extreme winter sports destination in the solar system. Fedrins, Gotarni, and Hauskers all came to trade and maybe to try their luck at the casinos. They were all right. But the Kevalites? They came just to cause trouble, as far as I could see. So it didn't surprise me when I got the call. There were more murders in the Kevalite district than all the others combined. Bogdan, my partner, he was still sleeping it off, so I went alone. By which I mean I was the only detective. I took two patrolmen with me, and there were four more waiting for us at the scene. Humans didn't go into the warren of corridors the Kevalites had decided were theirs unless they were well-armed and had backup. There was a crowd of Kevalites hanging around. Their basic body plan is humanoid, but with slightly longer legs, digitigrade, makes it look like they have backwards-facing knees, red-orange skin, a stubby snout, and long, pointed ears. They look mean, and that's not just because they have teeth like an alligator. They like to fight, and they're always looking for an excuse. A couple of the larger males eyeballed me as I shoved through them to get to the body, but I made sure they could see I was armed. They'd know who the killer was, of course, but they'd never say anything. Victim was a typical adult male Kevalite, average height, that is, half a foot taller than me, and average build. At a glance, it looked like he'd been stabbed, which is the favorite method for settling clan disputes. When it's personal, they use their teeth, and when it's not, well, Kevalite mercenaries will use any weapon they can get. Guns were officially banned, but a professional could get hold of one if he needed to, so this probably wasn't a contract hit. The victim, or his clan, must have offended someone who felt they had to send a message. That was the first thing that ran through my mind as I knelt down to examine the body. The six beat cops started pushing the crowd back, and it was only when I looked up again that I saw there was still one Kevalite in the space that had been cleared. A young one. They developed faster than us, so he was probably around five years old in absolute terms but in human terms, he might have been the equivalent of ten or thereabouts. Hey, is he here for a reason? I called out. It's the Vix kid, witness. They just left him there, standing next to his father's body. Most people wouldn't think about a Kevalite's feelings because they pretend they don't have any. Very macho. But I could see the kid was shaking, and I was a little shocked the other cops had just ignored him. Like I said, I was still wet behind the ears, and even with Bogdan's shining example to learn from, I still had a slightly rose-tinted view of my fellow officers. Didn't take me long to get the lay of the land, but right then I couldn't understand why none of them seemed to care or even notice. I'd become a lot harder as time went by, but over all the years since then, I've always tried to make sure I never got as jaded as them. I took the boy out of the corridor back into the workshop apartment that must have been their home. I put my arm around him, half expecting him to try and bite it off, but he didn't resist. After a moment or two, his glazed eyes started to come back into focus on the here and now. What's your name, kid? Zack. When they spoke to a human, they usually barked and snarled, but he had such a small voice. Is that your dad out there? Yeah. What's his name? Mazak. Right. Kevalites don't use surnames, but when they have a child, they give them the name they were born with and add another syllable to their own name and another when they became a grandparent, and so on. Parenthood is important to them, 
Birthdays are a celebration for both parent and child. They understand, maybe better than us, how becoming a parent changes you. In the bear pit of Kevalite clan life, the father-son bond was the only unbreakable constant. Zack had just lost the one person in the universe he could count on. Suddenly, I wanted to do more than just clear the case. I wanted to fix this. Somehow. If I hadn't been young and stupid, I'd have known that nothing can fix a loss like that. But I wanted to try anyway, and making whoever done it pay seemed like a good start. Did you see what happened? I asked, gently as I could. Yeah, they stabbed my dad. You saw who did it. You recognized them. Yeah, can't tell you, though. Don't you want to see them punished? Yeah. But I'm not supposed to talk to you, Dad said. I was about to say he'd make an exception in this case, but he probably wouldn't have. He was a Kevalite, and what happened between them was no one else's business. So instead, I just said, Your dad's dead, kid. Yeah, that means you decide whether you want to see whoever killed him go down for it. Yeah, still can't, though. They'll kill me, too. He said it so matter-of-factly like it was an everyday thing. And for him it was, I suppose, bodies turning up in Kevalite town because someone had opened their mouth to the wrong person was a common occurrence. I looked him square in the eyes and said firmly, No, they won't. I'll protect you. He looked at me, really looked at me for the first time, eyeing me up and down, assessing me. Then he did that ear flick they do instead of shaking their head. No, you won't. You're just a human. You lot don't care about us. I could have tried lying and said that the rights of Cavalites had always been a cause dear to my heart, but I had a feeling the kid would be able to tell. It was uncanny, the way he seemed to see right through me. So instead I just told the truth. I care about you. He looked at me again. Who the hell knows what he saw in me, but he said, Yeah, maybe, but you can't protect me. Kid, I promise you, anyone who wants to get to you will have to come through me. And because I wasn't quite that cocky, I added, and the rest of ESPD as well. They're strong. You're not. They'd kill you and then they'd kill me. How do you know I'm not strong? You're too nice. He said it with the certainty of someone saying that fire is hot and space is big, because that was how things worked in his world. The strong did what they wanted, and the weak suffered what they had to. If I wasn't bullying him and threatening him to tell me what I wanted, it was because I wasn't tough enough. Kevalites were loyal to their family, tolerated their clan, and everyone else was a target. I wasn't family or clan, so he literally couldn't understand why I was being nice to him. Zack, just give me a chance. You have to give me a chance, because if you don't talk to me, then whoever did this to your dad is going to get away with it. He snarled, showing his large, sharp teeth. It was the first sign of emotion he'd shown. I'll kill them. When I'm older. When I'm stronger. By the time you're old enough to do anything, they'll be long gone. Society was fluid on Europa. People came and went like money at the blackjack tables. By the time Zack was fully grown, the perps could be halfway across the galaxy. Besides, your dad tried to stand up to them, yeah? You think you'll be stronger than your dad? Zack was silent for a moment and I knew Kevalides well enough to know that he was torn between the Kevalite determination to be stronger than everyone, one day, and the fact that every Kevalite child wanted to grow into their father. Just come with me back to the station, I coaxed him. You'll have to come at some point for your dad. He'll be there, and there'll be paperwork and stuff you have to sign. Why? His ears flattened, a sign of anger. I'm his son. He should stay with me. That's what happens when there's a murder, I explained gently. Victim gets taken to the morgue so the medical examiner can have a look at them. Then the family has to come and tell us what they want done with the bod, with their relative, fill out all the forms for that, and then confirm their ID, because we can't just take someone's word they are who they say they are. Zack dipped his head, agreeing. He understood suspicion and mistrust, at least. I'll help you with all that. And if you don't want to say anything about what happened, then no one's going to make you. But while you're at the police station, take a look around. Maybe you'll decide we aren't so weak after all. Wordlessly, he took my hand. I made sure the beat cops had cleared everyone out of the corridors around the workshop before I took him out. I took him straight back to the sector police station, 
There was no point in sticking around at the crime scene. The canvas would come up with squat, as always, and unless the killers had left a note saying, I did it, signed X forensics wasn't likely to turn up anything. It was a simple stabbing in a public place. If the murder weapon had been dropped, we'd have found it already. And it didn't look like the victim had had a chance to fight back. We'd pick up the DNA of a thousand Kivalites who'd come to the workshop on business, and that would be all. Bogdan was awake when I got back, grumpy that I'd left him behind but already drinking again. I suggested he go off and look through the files the organized crime unit had on the Kevalite clans, maybe find out who the victim's clan had a beef with. I knew the answer was likely to be everyone, but it kept him busy, which was what I wanted, and it would mean hours sitting at a desk alone with no strenuous activity and no having to hide his hip flask, which was what Bogdan wanted. I sat with Zack. We had to wait until the coroner's people brought his dad in, and although there were other things I could be doing, none of them seemed more important. First I talked him through the paperwork he'd have to sign. Then we just chatted for a while. Not even about the case, just about life. I told him how I'd ended up on Europa Station. Long story, don't ask. Then he told me about how his father brought him here when he was just a few months old, because their clan was opening a salvage and repair business. I told him about how I wanted to join the police because my dad was a cop. At first, his answers were as terse as they'd been at the crime scene. But after a while, he began to really talk to me. What it was like helping his dad with the business, the other kids in his neighborhood, who he was friends with and who his enemies were. Even Kevalite children had a long list of alliances and grudges. But I noticed that the children he hung out with and the children he hated didn't seem to line up with the clan relationships. The way he talked about it made it seem like the adults had their politics, and the children had theirs, and neither were much interested in the others. Explained why clan feuds were so fluid, as soon as a new generation grew up, which happened fast with Kevalites, a whole new set of friendships and hatreds came into play. It gave me hope that one day there could be a generation that didn't feel the need to carry on its forebears' brutal way of life at all. Like I said, I was young and naive. We were sitting there for hours. After a while, he was too exhausted to do much talking and leaned against my arm while I went on and on about nothing very much. Then, just when I was sure he had finally dozed off, he turned his head and whispered in my ear, Razave, Zave, Tashek three names. I didn't have to ask him who they were. The arrests happened that evening. I would have liked to be there, but a lot of Kevalites had seen me at the workshop and I wanted to keep them guessing over what the charges were until we filed them. There were probably several dozen things clan boss Razave, his son, and his underboss could have been arrested for. Besides, I had to stay with Zack. He didn't want to leave my side, and I didn't want to leave him. I'd sworn I was going to protect him. And if I couldn't keep that promise to the kid, then I didn't deserve to hold a badge, even one as grimy as ESPD. Europa Station Police Department did not, you probably won't be surprised to learn, have a well-developed witness protection program, a human we could have kept safe simply by sending them back to Earth, or one of the many other shitholes the solar system has to offer. But a Kevalite will stand out wherever you send them, and we wouldn't have been able to find anyone who wanted to take him in anyway. They're not exactly popular. Couldn't give him back to his own clan, either. They'd take him, out of duty to their fallen clan brother. But in that situation, the kid gets treated like an unwanted stepchild at the best of times, and they weren't happy that he'd talk to the cops. Blood for blood, they understood. A retaliatory attack had certainly already been in the works, although most likely against some poor schmuck a lot lower down the hierarchy than the actual perpetrators. But bringing the cops down on the clan leader was tantamount to a nuclear strike, and Razave's clan would make Zack's clan pay the price for that. In my naivety, I'd considered none of that when I got him to talk to me. Not that I ever regretted it. To this very day. The Kevalites shouldn't have come to our system if they didn't like playing by our rules. And around here, when one person murders another, they get dragged out of their home in handcuffs and put behind bars. No exceptions. But that still left the problem of what to do with Zack. No witness protection program. Not for this penny-ante kind of case, at least. 
My bosses wanted to just dump him on social services like any other kid, but there was no way they'd find a placement for a Kevalite even if they could keep him safe, which they couldn't. The guys who arrested the perps found the murder weapon right there in the room with them, just sitting on a table. The arrogant bastards had been so sure no one would get the cops involved, they hadn't even bothered to get rid of the knife. Maybe it had sentimental value. I wouldn't put it past a Kevalite. There were flecks of barely dried blood on it, and it even had Razave's fingerprints. Open and shut case on him, at least. Zavi and Tashek might have walked if Zavi hadn't gone off on a rant, outraged that we dared to arrest him. Son of a clan boss, he inherited the sense of entitlement that came with the position, but not the brains that got Daddy where he was. Poor Tashek, he knew how to play the game and keep his mouth shut, but Zava's tirade managed to implicate both of them, which was good for Zack because it meant he didn't have to testify in court. But it was bad for him, too, because my bosses and the prosecutor didn't need him to make their case, and therefore weren't too concerned what happened to him. Don't get me wrong, they weren't bad people, but trying to keep crime down on Europa Station was like trying to empty the ocean with a sieve, and everyone had a long list of other problems they had to deal with before they could spare a thought for a Kevalite kid, even one who'd risked his neck for us. Just give him back to his clan was the general opinion. After all, he might live. After some frustrating conversations, bouncing from office to office and carrying a sleeping Zack around the building with me, I finally realized there was only one way I was going to keep him alive. I had to get him out of the solar system. Fortunately, our computers had files on every Kevalite immigrant, and when I started looking up his relatives, I found he had a grandfather back on Kaval. His father's father, Kima Zak, he was sure to take him in. Problem solved, right? Not quite. There was still the time it would take a message to get to Kemazak, and then the time it would take him to get to Europa Station. A week at least, probably more. So I took him home with me. It seemed like the quickest and easiest solution. Three weeks on the job, and already I was learning that sometimes you had to step around the letter of the rules in order to stick to their spirit. That first night, I dropped Zack on my bed, then locked the door and piled up every scrap of furniture I had in front of it, before falling asleep on the couch. I woke up with Zack looking at me and almost shot him. It was only then I realized I had my sidearm in my hand, newest model Gauss pistol, capable of magnetically accelerating a 9 mm round through 3 centimeters of steel. He looked at it, staring down the barrel, and then at me. He nodded approvingly. I had two weeks vacation time mandatory per year, and an extra two weeks if I met my performance reviews, which was basically a given in the ESPD. It didn't look good taking vacation days so soon, but my career would get over it. And besides, it wasn't like Bogdan was going to complain I wasn't around. We had fun together, Zack and me. Played a bit of Mario Kart, a bit of FIFA, some of the new Zero-G VR games from Camco. I wasn't great with kids, but at least back then I was young enough to remember being one. I ordered lunch from the Fedron place just down the corridor from my apartment, and dinner from the Moroccan kitchen in the spaceport terminal. The confirmation from his grandfather came in on the second day. Kemazak was coming to take his grandson home and taking the fastest passenger liner. Scheduled arrival time was at the end of the week, and I breathed a sigh of relief. All I had to do was sit tight for a few more days. There was no sign anyone was looking for Zack. No one had come to the department offices asking about him, and there were no Kevalites hanging around my neighborhood all of a sudden. I started to become a little less paranoid, and when the delivery runners dropped off the food, I didn't bother shoving the sofa back in front of the door. They came for him on the third night, half three in the morning or thereabouts. The bars had long since closed, and even the whores had finished for the night. The whole station was either asleep or unconscious, except for a few unlucky souls who'd made bad choices in life like criminals, cops, and ER doctors. There was just the slightest click, and the door opened a fraction. Then long fingers slipped through the gap and silently dragged it open. They didn't set up my alarms. I know I left them active that night, but someone must have hacked them somehow, because when the first Kevalite stepped through the door, they didn't raise a peep. A second and a third followed him, long legs softly padding across my living room, heading for the bedroom door. Lights. 
The low wattage energy saving bulbs flickered asthmatically into life, adding a little definition to the shadow puppet theater. Three Kevalites, frozen in mid stride, dressed like EVA workers with their helmets on to hide their identities, each with a long knife in his hand and me sitting in an armchair facing the door, pistol leveled at them. I nodded a greeting. Their sun visors were down, so all I could see was my own reflection looking back at me. But I looked them dead in the eyes all the same. No one moved. I sighed. The way I see it, you've got three choices. The first is to drop your knives and wait here, nice and calm, until my backup arrives to arrest you. The second is, you come at me and I shoot you dead. The third is you make a run for it and I still shoot you dead and say you were coming at me. Maybe not what a little goody two-shoes detective should do, but they'd come to murder a child. The only ways I'd let them leave my apartment was in handcuffs or a body bag. They hesitated. I thought about killing them all, surrender or no surrender. Then the leader dropped his knife and the other two followed a fraction of a second behind. And I was so tempted. But I'd be the one who'd have to clean the blood off the furniture. Turn around to face the wall and put your hands on it. Palms flat and... The leader pounced, drawing a second knife from his belt in the same instant as he leapt towards me. I calmly put two bullets in his chest. I may have been young, but I wasn't born yesterday. Kevalides didn't just give up without a fight, and faking a surrender was the oldest trick in the book. That was actually one of the few pieces of useful advice Bogdan had given me. When a Kevalite looks like he's beat, that's when he's most dangerous. Maybe the Kevalites should have learned a little about humans before they came to my apartment. When a human is protecting a child, that's when we're most dangerous. The lead Kevalite twitched for a moment, then lay still. I raised my gun to the other two. Anyone else want to try option two? Neither of them did. My colleagues arrived only a few minutes later. Credit where credit's due, ESPD might not be winning any prizes for police work. But that night they brought their A-game, a full squad of ten guys in tactical gear, armed to the teeth. If I had needed their help, well, they still probably wouldn't have been in time to stop me getting carved up like a ham, but they might have saved Zack. When they got there, they stormed in only to find one dead Kevalite and two others up against the wall, my gun on their backs. But I appreciated the effort. Oh, and they found me shaking like a leaf and almost hyperventilating. Adrenaline's a hell of a drug. First time I'd killed anyone, and first time I'd had someone try to kill me. Didn't enjoy it at the time, but it served me in good stead when I signed up to fight in the war. A lot of guys didn't make it back because they got that combat rush and either froze up or flipped out. But I already knew what it felt like. Look on the bright side, right? There was another bright side. For once, the brass got off their backsides as well. Kevalite on Kevalite violence. Well, that's just how they are, you know. Not much you can do about it, but attempted murder of a police officer. That lit a fire under their cushy desk chairs, and protecting me meant protecting Zack. By morning, Kevalite town was swarming with ESPD. If Razave had been feeling lonely without his clan around him, he wasn't anymore because virtually every one of them on Europa Station was hauled in for questioning, then charged with whatever we could find to charge them with. A few of them were cut loose. Maybe they were even innocent. But most of them had something we could pin on them, even if it was only illegal narcotics or stolen goods. We talked over finding a safe house for Zack and drawing up a proper plan to keep him safe, including a rota for officers to watch him. But the kid was determined not to be separated from me, and I was determined not to let him out of my sight, especially after last night. So it was decided everything would run smoother if I continued being team leader for his security arrangements. We stayed in a different hotel every day. Two guys in uniform in the room with us and two plainclothes guys outside watching the door. I brought the PlayStation XX5 with me, and we had a Mario Kart tournament with the uniforms during the day. Then we ordered takeout. Pizza, actually, which took me back to when I was Zack's age. I hadn't tried it since I left Earth. My grandparents swore by it, but it must have gone out of fashion sometime before I was born, because the only time I had it was when I was at their house. It was greasier than I remembered, but Zack seemed to quite like it, even if he did get cheese on the PlayStation gloves. There were no games on the night shift. I finally got to sleep, but the four officers on duty kept a careful eye out the whole night. I still kept my gun under my pillow just in case. 
The days ticked down and until finally it was Saturday. Departure day, Zack's grandfather was arriving in the morning and they'd be heading back to Caval on the same transport just a few hours later. It was over. The arrests, the security precautions. They'd worked. So why the tight feeling in my chest? Do I have to go back to Caval? Zack asked me as I was dividing up the pancakes for breakfast. I paused for a moment, then asked, Don't you want to go back to your home planet? Zack shrugged. I don't remember Caval. Dad brought me here when I was a few months old. The workshop was home before Dad... He stopped, trying to find the words. Cavalides aren't particularly articulate. Their kids are taught that actions speak louder than words. But Zack had something he wanted to say. I don't have a home now, but I like it here. Another pause, and I thought he'd finished, but then he added, With you. And that was when I realized I didn't want him to go. I'd spent so much time focused on the single goal of getting him off Europa Station that I hadn't stopped to consider that might not be what I really wanted. I thought about it. I really thought about it. Zack needed me, and the last couple of days... Well, I'd started to like having him in my life. There had to be a way I didn't have to say goodbye to him. I went over all kinds of different scenarios in my head, ways I could make it work. But in the end, I was a junior detective working long and awkward hours on a not particularly impressive salary, a one-bedroom apartment that I barely saw and no friends or family within a million kilometers who could help me out, and I might have found a way to do it despite all that. But I knew there was one thing I just couldn't do for Zack. I'm sorry, I told him. I'd like you to stay too, but Razave's clan, there are too many of them around here. You'd never be safe. I'd do my best to protect you, but sooner or later they'd find a way to get to you. I sighed. The only way you can grow up without constantly having to watch your back is if you do it far away from here, you understand? Zack nodded, because he did understand. And God, that made me sad. Europa Station had two spaceport terminals in those days, before the military added a couple more. There was the old crappy one where ships from the inner system docked, and there was the shiny new one where the interstellar liners came in. I guess we wanted to give aliens the impression that the station was less of a shithole than it really was. That was humanity in general back then. Trying to give the impression that we weren't the galaxy's version of a third world country. And not pulling it off very well. To save Zack's grandfather from having to go through customs and quarantine checks, he was staying in the disembarkation lounge and we were taking Zack to him. We had four officers to escort us to the terminal and a couple more were waiting for us there just in case. Most of Razave's clan was still in lockup, but we might have missed someone, and this would be their last chance to try anything. I wasn't too worried, but better safe than sorry. Zack was silent as we walked through the corridors to the spaceport, and although I wanted to talk, I couldn't find the words. The rest of Europa Station carried on around us as if it was a completely normal day. Then suddenly we were at the terminal, with its soaring arches and geodesic glass panels looking out to the stars, and the rest of our security detail was there, and there was no time left to say all the things I'd wanted to say. We waited a minute while the team leader, Lieutenant Santos, checked with spaceport security that we were clear to go through. Bogdan was there, in a trench coat that looked like it had been made in Bulgaria back when it was still communist. I thought it was to hide his hip flask until I saw he'd palmed one of those tiny bottles you get in hotel minibars. To give him credit, if I hadn't been looking for it, I'd never have noticed. He was a professional at some things, at least. He could have taken up stage magic, the way he made that bottle appear by his lips and then vanish. I saw Santos coming back to give us the go-ahead, and I knelt down beside Zack. I guess this is it, kid. Time to say goodbye. I don't want to. He was usually self-contained as Europa herself, with her miles-thick icy armor protecting the oceans underneath. But this time there was a quaver in his voice, a bit of emotion breaking through. I know, I don't want to say goodbye either, but this is what we need to do to make sure you're safe. Can't you come with me? Caval isn't a place for someone like me, you know that. If I tried to go to Caval on my own, I'd probably be dead within a week. Not exactly tourist-friendly. Even our embassy there had to rely on heavily armed mercenaries. Zack nodded. He knew how things worked back home, even if he didn't remember it. 
Maybe when I'm older and I'm big enough to protect you, you could come visit me? I'd like that. I smiled, knowing it would never happen. Zack was going to grow up a proper Kevalite, and by the time he was an adult, he'd be as deep in their culture as Razave. Maybe not quite such a bastard. Zack was a good kid, but he'd have to be just as hard. There was no other way to survive on Kaval. This would be our last goodbye, but at least this way he would survive. Come on, your grandfather's waiting, I said. I was about to get up, but on impulse I threw my arms around him and hugged him tight. I was probably the only person apart from his father who'd ever hugged him, but after a second's hesitation he did the same, and while I had him tucked against me, shoulder under my chin, I happened to glance up, out through the glass domes into the vastness of the cosmos, at the scattering of diamonds across the endless, endless night. Caval was out there somewhere, and soon Zack would be too, safe and, I hoped, happy. Then I saw the flicker of movement on the gantries crisscrossing through the top of the dome. Only a small flash of light caught on a bit of metal, almost like just another star twinkling. I spun, pulling Zack off his feet and hauling him around. I shouted a warning, and just as I began to dive to the ground, I felt something shove me in the back so I had to put my hand out to break my fall. Keeping Zack beneath me, I looked round, trying to find the shooter again. Something stung my arm right by where Zack's head was, and I rolled onto my side to keep my body facing the direction of the shooter. Another punch in my back, knocking the breath out of me. The other cops were fanning out, drawing their guns. With my back to the shooter, I couldn't see what they were doing, but I could hear the whine of their guns' capacitors charging every time they fired. They must have forced the shooter into cover because no more shots came. And then I saw the other shooter coming out of the crowd, drawing a snub-nosed machine pistol compact enough to fit inside a pocket, designed to spray down everything within ten feet. Me, Zack, and the cops, distracted by the shooter up in the gantries who all had their backs to him. I was lying on my holster. There was no way I could draw in time. I watched the muzzle come up and hugged Zack tight against me. Sorry, kid, I tried. And then in came goddamn Bogdan with a pump-action shotgun that appeared from nowhere, advancing on the Kevalite hitman like the Red Army on Berlin, trench coat flapping around him. His first blast clipped Kevalite in the shoulder, and a burst from the machine pistol went wild. Above even all the tourists screaming, the shotgun shells roared like a cannon. No neat, clean magnets. That was gunpowder. The Kevalite tried to turn on him, but Bogdan's next shot took him in the chest, and he still wasn't done. Step. Fire. Rack. Step. Fire. Rack. The hitman was blasted off his feet, crashing back into a souvenir stand. Bogdan beckoned at me. I needed to get up off the floor and get to cover. I tried to stand, but my left leg wasn't working properly. I looked down and saw the blood, then noticed the bullet holes in the paving. That burst from the machine pistol had been a lot closer than I realized. I started limping, half covering Zack and half leaning on him, heading for a big concrete planter filled with ferns. I was pretty sure the Kevalite sprawled over the plushy Pokemon wouldn't be getting up again. Bogdan had permanently revoked his visa. But there was still the sniper up above. Something took a chunk out of the paving just ahead of me, and I lurched to one side. Bogdan was walking backwards beside me, reloading his shotgun and cursing under his breath in Bulgarian. The planter was only a few paces away. Limping along, my legs started to give out, and I almost fell. Just at that moment, I heard something whiz past my ear. Somehow, I found the strength to push on. The shotgun came up to Bogdan's shoulder, and there was a scream like a jet engine. I looked round just as he fired again, and a mini-rocket with a tail of flame shot out, arcing upwards to burst like a nova up among the gantries. Long-range stun grenade. I'd read about them in the police handbook, but I'd never seen them used before. Hell, I didn't even think we had any in the armory. Bogdan must have had his own personal stash. I dragged my leg the last few steps, shoved Zack down, then almost collapsed on top of him, pressed my back up against the planter, and finally drew my pistol. Not much good now. I couldn't hit the sniper at this distance even if my vision wasn't blurry. I looked down at my leg. Damn, that really was a lot of blood. Zack was looking at me with fear in his eyes, poor kid. First he loses his father, then not one but two assassination attempts. Hell of a week for a ten-year-old. Don't worry, we're safe here. 
I tried to say, but I was slurring the words. Just sit tight. Keep your head down. It'll be okay. Zack had taken his jacket off and had it pressed against my thigh. He was getting blood all over it. I tried to push it away before it got ruined, but somehow my arms didn't want to work now. Don't worry, it's fine, it's fine, I told him. Just stay in cover. It'll be okay. It'll be... okay. I looked round over my shoulder trying to check if the sniper had repositioned. I could see the dome and beyond it the endless night of space scattered with stars. The stars seemed to be going out, the darkness swallowing them one by one, until at last there was nothing but the black and silence. They held the commendation ceremony for me on the Wednesday. I didn't attend, of course, but I'm told it was very moving. The commissioner was there and the mayor. The shootout in the interstellar space terminal had made the news all across the solar system. The commissioner presented a medal to my stand-in. My dad, who'd flown in all the way from Earth, and then the mayor gave the commissioner an award from the city to be displayed in ESPD headquarters. Bogdan got a medal as well, and the other members of the protection detail all got ribbons. Cue fanfare and applause. There was a reception afterwards. It's a shame I missed it, really. I would have loved to hobnob with the mayor. He was the first politician I ever voted for, one of the last, too. Then I woke up. The first thing I realized was Zack wasn't there, so I started screaming. And I mean really screaming, like a stimhead who'd injected a Saturday night special was about to make it everyone's problem. It was only when I heard my mom's voice that I stopped to look around. I was in the hospital. I had tubes in me, and I was wired up like one of those old-timey bombs with the large digital clocks. Briefly, I wondered which one I had to cut to defuse myself, which made me giggle. That was when I realized I probably was on drugs. In fact, from the number of tubes, it looked like I was on more drugs than I'd busted during my rotation with Vice. It took a while before I was lucid enough to explain things to me. They started with my injuries. Firstly, the flesh wound in my upper arm, not serious, and with modern medicine wouldn't even leave a scar. That was the good news. The less good news was the torso. Mercifully, my armor vest had done its job for the most part, and the bullets hadn't penetrated. In order to smuggle his rifle through the station, the hitmen used a fairly low-powered variant. However, they had hit me hard enough to break two of my ribs and cause a moderate amount of internal bleeding. The thigh wound had been the worst. The bullet had penetrated deep enough to nick an artery, and if I'd arrived in the operating room a minute or two later, I might not have made it. And because the machine pistol was also low power, the bullet hadn't gone straight through, meaning I'd undergone a long and complicated surgery to remove it. The surgeons were hopeful that I'd make a full recovery, but that was still a hope more than a promise, and either way I'd be off my feet for a while. Then they reached the subject I was really interested in, Zack. I braced myself for bad news. Zack was fine. The shootout had ended shortly after I lost consciousness when the sniper fell from the gantry, down more than fifty feet onto the faux marble, so he'd never be a problem again, except to the cleaning crew. The official explanation was that he slipped while trying to flee, but it was assumed Bogdan's flares were a contributory factor. Both shooters had been identified as guns for hire from the local Kevalite community, fairly high-end. As soon as it was clear to move, Lieutenant Santos had left two men to watch me, and with the rest, got Zack out of there. They had to prise his fingers off my leg, pick him up, and carry him to the embarkation gate. But they got him out of there. His grandfather was at the gate to take him, and they were on the space liner within ten minutes, then out of the solar system a few hours later. By now, they'd be back on Caval. He was okay. I breathed a sigh of relief. It had been a bumpy ride, but we'd got there. And if there was a part of me that hurt more than the pain in my arm or chest or leg, well, there was no sense in dwelling on that. Saying goodbye to Zack was the hardest thing I'd ever had to do, but it was worth it to know he was safe. So that's it. Story over. My first case, made a friend, got a few Kevalite bullets in me, but it worked out for the best. All wrapped up pretty neatly, right? Nothing's ever that simple. As you know, that was far from the last time we had Kevalites causing trouble. It wasn't the last time I was shot by a Kevalite, for that matter. The war came, what, five, six years later? 
Life had knocked a few of the rough edges off me by that point, but I was still young, still eager to do my part. I'd seen plenty of violence, or thought I had, and I knew how to handle a weapon. I thought I could make a difference. Maybe I'd still sign up if I had to do it all over again, but I sure as hell would have had less of a spring in my step as I went to the recruiting office. It was on my third tour of duty. Out on the old Chinese mining colonies in the Guangdong system, asteroids riddled with tunnels and rusting equipment that no one had used in decades. Too much rock to blast the enemy out, too valuable as a forward operating base to ignore. Not that different to Europa Station for the most part. Claustrophobic corridors that all looked the same, blind corner after blind corner, never knowing what you'd run into around the next one. The Kevalite Alliance got there first, so we had to go in and winkle them out, room by room, section by section. I was a captain by that point. Benefits of a war like that, you get promoted fast. Shiny new regiment, put together from a couple that had been shot up too bad to go on, including mine. Two companies were drawing the enemy's fire at the main dock, while mine and another penetrated at secondary airlocks and pushed in towards the command center. I was leading Delta Company, four platoons under my command, and we were doing well. They were making us pay for every room, but we were pushing them back. After a while, I got word that Gamma Company had taken the command center and the whole Kevalite resistance was collapsing, breaking up into small units fighting desperate last stands. The Kevalites I was fighting started falling back, probably trying to link up with what remained of their forces so they could stage a counterattack. I wasn't about to let that happen, so I managed to pin them down for a bit and get two of my platoons behind them. In the end, I penned them up in one of the huge hangars that used to hold the mining drills. If I took the pressure off for even a moment, they'd break out again, but I had them trapped. It was all but over. Question was, how long would it take for them to admit it? Kivalites didn't give up easily, as I well knew. I could easily lose a third of my company trying to scour them out of every nook and cranny. We'd get them in the end, but it'd be bloody. So I decided to try and talk to them. Even the Kevalites have rules in war, and after a bit of back and forth we called a temporary truce. I stepped out into the hangar, realized I had no clue what I was going to say, and decided to just wing it. We've got you surrounded. It's over, and you know it. There's no point in dragging this out, but I promise you, if you surrender, you'll be treated well. Someone shouted back at me from behind a stack of crates. I have a counteroffer, human. You let us pull back to our shuttles and we'll let you keep this worthless rock. Let me get my warriors out of here or I will make you pay in blood for every step forward you take. I shook my head. Sorry, can't do it. As much as I'd like to finish this without a slaughter, I can't let you go or you'll be back shooting at us next week. That is true enough, the voice admitted with a laugh. A valid fear. You were lucky this time, but meet us again and we will kill you all. You would be a fool to let us go. For the record, I don't want to do this. Come on, there has to be some way we can talk this out, please. There was a pause, and I thought the enemy commander was thinking about my offer. Then he said something that came completely out of left field. Did you used to be a lawman on Europa Station? I stopped, like an old-timey computer that had crashed. How the hell could he know who I was? Was he someone I'd arrested once? I knew there was something familiar about the Kevalite's voice, but for a second I couldn't place it. Then it hit me. Zack, it is you then. He stepped out from behind one of the crates. He was taller now, and he'd filled out well. An adult Kevalite in his prime, 200 pounds of muscle and aggression, but there was still something recognizable in his face. And it is you, I replied. What? I mean, how? I wanted to ask him how he'd ended up here, but that was obvious. He was a Kevalite, just the right age for conscription, and he spoke a human language fluently and knew our culture. The galaxy is smaller than you'd think. So instead I asked him, How have you been, kid? Not bad, thanks to you. You know, all these years I thought you were dead. No one ever told me what happened to you, and, well... Last time I saw you, yeah, wasn't pretty, but I pulled through. If I'd known, I might have tried to. He stopped and flicked his ears in irritation. I don't know, do something. Did you ever think about me, about getting in touch? Did I think about you? Of course. Every day for months and after that still fairly often, but you had a new life. 
The whole point was for you to leave what happened on Europa Station behind. I looked around pointedly at the Kevalite soldiers training their guns on me. You know, we've got to decide what we're going to do about this. A low growl emerged from the back of Zack's throat. There's nothing to decide. We're Kevalites. We fight. You'll lose, maybe. But if we do, we'll take a lot of you with us. You'll take some of us with you, and then you'll all be dead. And for what? Your position's hopeless. If I were in your place, I'd surrender. You're human, though. You're weak. You don't like fighting. When things get bad, you just give up. We're Kevalites. We don't give up, ever. Even if we lose this battle, we'll never give up, because we're strong. That's why we'll win, eventually. His grandfather's words, and all the other Kevalites he'd lived around since I last saw him. Growing up on Europa Station, with a father who was willing to come to an alien world, and who was willing to stand up to someone like Razave. There'd been something different about Zack. He'd seen a universe most of his kind didn't get to see. But after six years on their home planet, it seemed like he was just another Kevalite now. Or was he? Maybe I was just imagining it. Maybe it was just what I wanted to see, but something in his eyes said he didn't really believe the words he was saying. I decided to test it. No, that's why you'll always lose, because no matter how many other species you defeat, you'll still live in a society run by bullies who think strength is having the power to push people around. Nothing will ever change. Nothing will ever get better. And good men will keep dying because some clan boss took offense over nothing and leave behind kids who deserve better. It was a low blow, I knew, but it had to be said. Zack went real still, and for a moment, I thought he was going to leap forward and bite my throat out. But then he said quietly, We're still Kevalites. I never said you weren't, but maybe being a Kevalite doesn't have to mean what people like Razave think it does. I could see he was thinking, but I couldn't tell which way it was going to go. My words had hit the mark, but they had to get through layers of Kevalite tradition that were millennia thick. The seconds ticked by, I couldn't bear it. You know I mean it when I say we'll treat you right. You and your warriors, come on, please, don't make me do this, not after, not after everything. He looked at me and I could just see the sadness in his eyes behind the mask of Kevalite aggression. I have to talk this over with my clan brothers. I will tell them your offer is genuine, but after that, either way, thank you, for everything. I nodded. I'll give you ten minutes. He turned and went back into cover and I retreated back to our line. I felt sick to my stomach. Any moment now, I was going to have to order my men to storm the hangar, and every Kevalite in there was going to die, including Zack. But the ball was in their court now. There was nothing I could do. Sorry, kid, I tried. Just before the ten minutes were up, they surrendered. I think it was probably the single happiest moment of my life. Zack was taken back to Seoul as a POW put in an internment facility on Mars for the rest of the war, along with the 120 warriors he'd been commanding that day. I came back to visit him as often as I could, which wasn't as often as I'd have liked, but there was a war on. I tried to make sure he got the best accommodations, the best food, but he refused it. Wouldn't take anything that wasn't offered to the rest of his clan. It wasn't that bad. God knows we both lived with worse on Europa Station but I wished there was more I could do for him. But he seemed content and happy to see me whenever I could make it. It was amazing how easily we fell back into each other's company when we'd known each other for all of a week the first time around. I guess sometimes it's the quality rather than the quantity of time you spend together. I even smuggled him some pizza once, which was about the biggest gift I could get him to accept. I at least made damn sure the guards knew that if anything happened to him, then I, a captain and a war hero, would see to it they ended up at the very frontmost of the front lines. There was inter-clan violence in the POW camps, and rumors the guards encouraged it. I wasn't about to take chances. The guards told me Zack was one of the ones who could take care of themselves. Most Kevalites came in injured. They hadn't surrendered willingly. They'd just been captured when the rest of their unit was dead and they were too beat up to go on fighting. Whereas Zack was as fit as Kevalites got, and he had a bunch of his clan brothers to back him up, and better than that, he had a personality beyond mindless belligerence. The guards liked him because he didn't make trouble and he didn't invite trouble, but they assured me, 
with my face right up in theirs that they'd take special care he was all right. Two more years. The longest two years of my life. It was almost more stressful coming home from the front, wondering whether Zack would still be there. But he was, waiting for me every time. And when we finally won, or at least didn't lose, which was basically the same thing when the Kevalites were supposed to steamroll us easily, he was there to greet me when I came home for the final time. I was able to get him released on parole until he could be repatriated. We had some good times together, bumming about the solar system on my officer's pass. Eventually, he had to go home with the rest of his clan brothers. We kept in touch, but I didn't see him for a while after that. He was busy. There were changes on Caval after the war didn't turn out the way it was supposed to. Changes Zack had a lot to do with. A lot of people accused him of weakness for getting captured, but unlike most Kevalites, instead of choosing between violence or silence, Zack argued back. With words. He wasn't the one who lost the war, but he did bring 120 of his brothers home. He told them that strength doesn't just have to be the power to hurt your enemies. It can be protecting the ones you love, too. A lot of the younger Kevalites agreed with him across the clans. They'd taken heavy casualties at the behest of their elders, and after the war, many of them started to ask why. And once they started questioning the war, they started questioning other things about Kevalite society as well. Caval didn't change overnight, but it changed. They're still not exactly pacifists, but compared to what they were when I was young, you could probably walk around Caval for a whole month and not get murdered, which would have been unthinkable back in the day. After the war, I went back to being a cop, on Venus for a while and then back to Earth. Life got busy, both with work and family, and there were times I couldn't see Zack as much. But we never lost touch. Never again. I keep calling him Zack. He's Zamazak now, and from what he tells me about his grandson, he'll probably have to find another syllable soon. Yeah, Zamazak rather than Kemazak. He took his father's name, but when it was time for him to become a grandfather, well, he didn't want to repeat the mistakes his own grandfather made. Actually, I shouldn't even call him Zamazak. He's General Zamazak, Commander-in-Chief of the Kevalite Union Military. The clans still have their own forces, but now there's a unified cross-clan force to balance them out, to make sure that clan bosses can't just do whatever they want, and someone is there to protect those who need protecting, a different kind of strength. I couldn't be prouder of him.